You are now tuned in to Owen's Exhibit. On this episode, I'm joined by Ali, who is the founder and creator behind the Untrend Shop, which offers upcycled denim clothing and chain stitch embroidery. We begin the episode by talking about how she got interested in fashion, and then we move on to talking about her education in fashion. There's lots to learn if you're interested in becoming a fashion designer, or maybe if you have a creative passion that you're trying to pursue. I really hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome back, listeners. You're listening to Owen's Exhibit. I'm here with a special guest. Her name is Allie. Allie, if you don't mind just sharing what you do, where you're from. My name is Allie, and um, my brand is called The Untrend Shop. Um, it is a upcycle denim brand. Um, I focus on upcycling thrifted pieces, and then I also do custom embroidery. Um, originally from Minnesota, but I've been in New York for about nine years. I did see that, that you've been in New York for nine years now. Mm-hmm. How do you feel? I feel like this is home (laughs) but it kind of feels like it's always been even since I moved here like I just have always felt like I fit more here than anywhere else that's uh that's interesting that's interesting to hear as soon as you got here it really felt like home to you do you know why what what about it makes it feel like home um this is a weird little thing but I think like growing up in Minnesota I always wanted to express myself with my like wardrobe and it always felt like if you did that you were like the center of attention anywhere you went if you were like dressed any kind of crazy and I feel like when I first got here just kind of like walking around I have a memory of just being immediately so excited and inspired by what everybody was wearing and feeling like very comfortable that I could just wear and be and express myself however I wanted to. That's good that you found the right place to do that. Yeah. What's the best meal that you can cook? <laughs> um, this isn't going to sound super impressive, but I make really good tofu tacos. Um, I'm not a vegetarian. I eat meat, but I just like really like tofu tacos and I'm really good at them. <laughs> What's in the tofu taco? Um, I think it's the way that I like fry the like the tofu that makes it really good and then I just load up a bunch of toppings but yeah interesting I do like enjoy tofu tacos too I think it's it's different than the consistency obviously of the traditional taco yeah (laughs) and also just like if you can do you make the tofu super crunchy a little crunchy sometimes I'll throw in like potatoes with it or mushrooms and then, yeah, of course, like avocado and all the other good stuff. But, yeah. It's, it's a better answer than saying mac and cheese. So I think you... <laughs> it's like a little bit of a step it. up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> a little better than noodles. How do you spend a rainy day? Um, I wish I could spend a rainy day laying in my bed and not doing anything. But I would say normally I just try to wear something that's not going to get all dirty <laughs> walking around New York. And I go and do my normal day. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you just try to dress up in boots and neutral clothing? What's the No, dark exactly? colors. Because dark. if I wear any of my light pants, then the rain like on the right. streets mixed with the dirt of the city like kicks back and gets like dirt splatter on my pants. That's true when you're so. kicking up your heels and stuff. Mm-hmm. I know for me, one of the things I was like became very obvious is that you shouldn't stand close to the curb when it's raining because you know, like those puddles form and then the cars come by. Yeah, it Have seems like something that only like happens that? in a movie, but it actually yeah, does happen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was like, I started like, you know, realizing, I was like, wait, this is, this is reality. Like I could just get splashed. Yeah, no, many times. It's so funny. So yeah, that's my only thing I think about on a rainy day. It's just like how to dress. How to dress. <laughs> yep. What is your favorite plant? Um, plant? Oh, I had this really beautiful plant that is dead now but it was a purple passion plant it's a hanging plant and the leaves are um like velvety purple 
That yeah. does sound very it's, beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. When you wake up, do you hit snooze on your alarm? Um, yeah, I'm not a morning person at all. Um, I actually had to buy a an alarm clock, like an old school like alarm clock, and put it on the other side of the room so that I have to get up and walk across the room to press snooze, and then I still go back to bed and like let it happen like two or three times. It's like a little 10 minute snooze, and then I get, but it gets me on my feet and then I'm like aware of the fact that like I'm about to go press snooze. So it's helped a lot, but yeah, I'm not the right person. Right. What do you think would fix your problems of waking up? Going to bed earlier. earlier. (laughs) Yeah. I like to stay up late. I feel like if I go to bed early, I'm like, I'm, I don't don't know. You're wasting some of the days. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that. I don't know why I've always felt like this weird, like FOMO if I go to bed early. That's true. I do feel that too. You're wondering, okay, there's got to be more that I can do today. Yeah, yeah. It's, I still have some of the day left. Why not use it? Mm -hmm. So just trying to figure out how you can feel content with ending your day and ending it. I don't know if I ever will, but hopefully I'm sure at some point I'll have to. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Have you worked any odd jobs? Um, probably the, the weirdest job I've worked here it's not super weird, but just kind of random. I was a dispatcher at a restaurant. So I just answered the phone and took the delivery orders and typed them into the system. Okay. And then I prepped the orders coming out of the kitchen with like sauces and like stuff so that the delivery drivers like had the next order to take out or like I'd make like the milkshake for the order or put like the coffee in the container. Like, I guess you don't think about when you order food that somebody's doing all that stuff. And it's usually probably like someone with a different role, like a server or something. But I was specifically dispatcher. But I was really good at it. You're really good at it. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like it. You were making the milkshakes yeah. and preparing mm-hmm. all the sauces. I was organized. I was fast. I like, yeah. I was, Do you I think was you learned dispatcher. anything from that experience? Um, I had that job when I was working... Uh, my full-time fashion job strictly so that I could like go somewhere after work and even though it was more work it didn't feel like it because it was just like a fun environment and I got to like meet a lot of friends and stuff through that so it wasn't necessarily I guess learning something about that will like help me in my career or anything but like I guess learning something about myself that like I enjoy having types of jobs where it feels like a fun environment and doesn't feel as much like work that's good that you recognize that Do you drink coffee? Yes. What is your favorite type of coffee? I I love an oat milk latte. Um, I'm a hot coffee drinker all all year round. I don't really do iced coffee ever. Yikes. Even in, because I just like, it makes me feel like warm and fuzzy inside. Right. Yeah. But I'm also only a one coffee a day kind of person. Like I can't do more than that really. Yeah. And have you tried anything else besides coffee, like tea? Or is it strictly coffee? I got really into tea in college, but then just the whole, I don't know, I guess every time I get a tea at a place, when I order one, I feel like it doesn't have enough flavor. Right. And that's like disappointing. So, yeah. So you're going to stick to the oat milk latte. Yeah. Do you have a favorite arcade game? Um, I love arcades. Probably Ski Ball. Yeah. What are some other games you enjoy? Um, just like anything where I can try to win a bunch of tickets. Because I don't know what it is, but like, just that feeling of getting to go get like a Laffy Taffy or like <laughs> this tiny little candy, even though like that's all it is. And it was like, you know, fifty a 50 cent candy. But right. like having enough tickets to like get like the candy you want or the prize you want is like, yeah. So I liked playing all the like more lottery ones where you have to like land the like button on like the right thing and you can like win a bunch of tickets. Like right. those games are fun. Yeah. Those games are fun. I think, I don't know. I think the best investment would be to like do the jackpot one where you gotta like hit the. It's like going around the outside of the screen. It's the little dot and you have to hit it right on the exact. Yeah, dot. yeah, that's and what I mean. The jackpot. And you just hit the one button. Yeah. And it's also fun because like you every time you're like, oh my god, I was so <sighs> close. Like let's do it again. Yeah. That's definitely a really good investment. So 
you like arcade games. What other hobbies do you have? That's a hard one because I feel like I, my like what uh, people might consider to be hobbies, I've kind of like turned into like <laughs> my career. Um, I really like love drawing. So I recently got an iPad and when I am not super busy with commissions or events or everything else going on, I like to like, it's still part of my work, I guess, but like getting to like just draw and sort of get my like creative ideas out is like something I like love doing. So you're more of a digital person as opposed to pen and paper or I guess pencil and paper? Um, not necessarily, actually. I used to draw everything on pen and paper, but then now it just almost easier to just do it on the iPad. I'm learning how to, and it's been really fun. So it's new for me, but I, I really like it. That's cool. And do you post any of the drawings that you create, or how quickly do drawings become a reality in your designs? Um, It depends on... Like, I feel like I go through phases of busyness. Like, right now, I'm actually kind of in a more chill spot. Like, I finished some big projects recently, and now I have some time. So I've been designing more lately, and, like, that always, like, makes me feel more, like, like I'm really doing what I love. That's cool. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a hobby, really, but it's part of my work that I love doing. Yeah, if you enjoy it and it doesn't seem like work and yeah. you're able to find a place and time to do it that is outside of the normal working hours. I feel like that's definitely considered a hobby. I wanna go back to how you got interested in fashion and maybe just talk a little bit about growing up and how everything kind of like fell into place. You grew up in Minnesota. What was your kind of first exposure to becoming interested in fashion? Um, I would say that I have always been, like I told you, I've always loved drawing and art and my mom is a graphic designer so she's always inspired me artistically um, and like both of my sisters have always been like very artistic as well so I feel like we just kind of like fostered like the arts in our family um, and then I think I remember I was never like that kind of like that person that like read Vogue or was like really like excited or interested in all the fashion magazines. I think I just knew I wanted to be an artist and then I remember finding out that you could go to college for fashion design and like that realization like I, I remember that moment of being like like oh I can like that's a life hack like I can go to college but not like do school like I can actually like go to college for art or fashion. Like I just didn't really like think or know about that when I was younger, I guess. So I remember like when I found that out, like that just seemed like a really cool way to kind of like translate being an artist into like kind of making it wearable, I guess. I see. Yeah. And did you go to a traditional high school? Yeah, I went to just like a, well, I went to a, a private Catholic high school actually <laughs> and were you doing anything related to drawing and art there were you being exposed to it in art classes or anything like that um yeah yeah we did have like um I took like a painting class I took an art metals class um or like a 3d art class um we had like stained glass was a class you could take um yeah so I was definitely like immersing myself in like all the arts that I could and then just doing my own like independent sketching and stuff in high school. Right. Yeah. And I guess nobody else really guided you when you decided to choose where you wanted to go to college. So how did you decide what college program you wanted to do? Because I think the program that you got involved in is mm -hmm. definitely kind of more, it's not as common. So if you wanted yeah. to talk about that. Um, I think that I was always like, interested in New York and intrigued but I um, had never been here and I I don't really remember exactly what made me think like oh I have to go to New York or anything I just kind of also knew that it was a fashion hub um, and it seemed like like a cool exciting place but I think that I was definitely intimidated by the idea of just like 
coming out here at age 18 and like being so far away from family because I don't have any family out here really. Like um, I do kind of now, but not then. Um, And so I found this program at Madison, UW Madison, Wisconsin, that was three years at Madison and one year at FIT, um, like your senior year. So kind of like those three years at Madison, you're building up to apply to go to the one-year fashion design program at FIT. And still with those three years, like we all didn't know, like if we were going to get in, it was just like what you're kind of like building up towards. Um, But yeah, I think I just found that school. And then um, like I was looking into like closer schools that had fashion programs and um, I got into a few other ones like Iowa and, and stuff like that. But this one was sort of that bridged gap where I was like, okay, I could then spend these three years still close to home and then go out there my senior year or hopefully, you know, like if I got in. So, yeah. And when you were in, when you were at Madison, uh, University of Wisconsin, mm-hmm. were you already deciding what you wanted to do in fashion? Were you like, I want to be a buyer? Were you like, oh, I want to be a designer? What was going through your mind in terms of what career you wanted? So the program that I was in was called um, textile and apparel design and it was really really like creatively focused so just kind of like fostering your creativity and also learning all of those hands-on skills um, there were other programs that were like fashion merchandising and stuff like that um, and those programs I think were more geared towards people figuring out like what type of job they might want to do, like a like a buyer. With our program, it was mostly just like, okay, we're learning these skills. And I mean, yeah, I think the aspiration for anyone in our program was to be a fashion designer. But I definitely feel like we didn't know what that meant or like what that could lead us to. Or you have this idea in your head because you're an artist and you're a designer that you're just going to like be doing that and beginning to be super creative like in your career as well. Um, and I think obviously there are jobs that you get to do that, but I think that there wasn't necessarily like a, um, a clear idea of like, yeah, w- what a job would really look like when I was in college. What else were you involved in at college? Were you involved in any clubs? Do you remember any experiences that really taught you a lot about your ability to create and your skills? Um, I mean, I wasn't in, I, I took some other like elective art classes that I guess just kind of also like let me explore creativity. Like I took a jewelry making class. Um, I would just say in general, like the program that I did and even like the year I did at FIT, Like, I'm so glad that it was so skill-focused and so creative. Um, But I think, like, all the discovering of, like, what my career was going to be happened, like, after the fact. And there wasn't really much, like, there wasn't any programs or anything that really, like, pushed me into where I am now. It just kind of developed all of my skills. And, like, that's also super valuable. Right. Yeah. So the discovery happened after college. You were more so explore. You were doing more so development of your skills and abilities mm-hmm. in college, and really just trying to take as much as you could from the courses, as opposed to really trying to focus on what you were going to be doing with these skills afterwards. One hundred percent. Yeah. I don't even think like I th- I thought about it, but I didn't. I didn't really know. I just didn't know what it looked like because I didn't really know what a job would be like. And then I also didn't know what it would take to be an independent designer and, you know, foster that or in what way I might want to do that. And I think that a lot of the people that I went to school with have gone into the corporate fashion path and just stuck with that. And I think if you were to ask them maybe what they thought they were going to be doing when they were in college, it would probably be kind of a different answer than what they're doing now, which it is for me too, but in, yeah. So you went to the University of Wisconsin and you got a bachelor's and then Mm -hmm. 
you went to FIT and you got an associate's in fashion. Mm -hmm. And those both are very accelerated programs, right? Because one's uh, supposed to be four years, one's supposed to be two years. Yeah. Did it feel very intensive? Um, yeah, definitely both of them did. Um, I pretty much, I mean, we would pretty much like sleep over at the studio and at Madison because we would just be there all the time just creating, like they let us just stay and sleep in the building. <laughs> it was crazy. Um, and then FIT started off really slow and sort of like reviewing basics of like what we had already learned. And then the second half of the year was like super accelerated and like um, definitely more technical and less creative focused and we had more classes that geared us towards um we had more classes at FIT that year that would gear us towards like what we might be doing as a designer at a company um so that was helpful but I feel like there was only like a class or two so do you have any crazy stories from those times that you spent late in the studio any mm -hmm. memorable experiences that you maybe don't want to relive or maybe that you do want to relive I mean, nothing crazy dramatic, just like, we, yeah, we would just sleep there. I mean, we would go into the like lobby area and we would take all of the couches and put them together and make like a big like super bed. And then we, I guess, I don't even know if we had blankets or if we just used fabric, but we would just like, <laughs> we'd be like, well, we're going to do it. And we would sometimes plan it. We'd be like, we're going to have an, all, we're going to do an all night on this day. And then, like, whoever wanted to come, we would just, it was, like, a bunch of people were just, we would just work all night, but then, like, sleep there for a few hours, and then our teachers just kind of, like, understood, and, like, we would come to class and get our coffees and just be, like, disheveled, and they didn't care, they were just, like, they're working hard, and, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was sort of crazy, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can definitely say that being more in a creative major is a lot different than being in a lot of other majors because you can try to perfect your work as much as you want up until that deadline you could be working for the entire week it's mm -hmm. not it's not so cut and paste it's yeah it's very it's up to you how much work you want to put in would you consider yourself a perfectionist Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. I will redo something a bunch of times until it's, it's right. <laughs> and how do you know when it's right? What, what feeling do you have? Do you, I think I just have high like, expectations hey, for like quality of the work. Right. Yeah. So like in sewing that becomes so hard because like you can sew a sleeve on to something and it can be perfect and you might have like one little like pucker in the seam or like it might be like shifted in more than you want it to be like such small things so you can sit there and redo a seam like so many times like yeah every like sewer I feel like will say that like a seam ripper is like their best friend and their enemy at the same time because you hate having to use it but like it's also like the best tool because you can just rip the seam right open but yeah in sewing it can be if you're a perfectionist it can take you just like so much longer to do and even in embroidery like the types of stitching that I do I, I can pull it right out if I don't like it or I can go back and go over it or use a different color to go over something so yeah um it, it definitely the creative process can be long and grueling. Um, something else interesting about that too, which I think I heard someone say recently and it kind of stuck with me, is that I think whenever you learn any kind of creative skill, there's always gonna be that period of time when you first learn how to do something where like everything you're making like kind of sucks because you're still working out like what your creative vision is and you're still learning how to do something the right way. And so you might spend like a week making something and then you're sitting at your critique looking at it and you hate it because it maybe isn't that good because you're still learning. So I think in college, like I didn't really think or know that at the time, but looking back, I'm like, 
we were all going through a phase of producing shitty work because you have to do that no matter what you're doing, I think, creatively until you get to a point where you're making good things. I can speak on that too because when you're creating these things, you're also in a period where you're progressing very rapidly to the point where mm-hmm. like you might produce something, you might think it's good, and then you look back and you're like, I can do way better. Mm-hmm. You're just progressing at such a high rate that yeah, that's true. you're just like constantly looking back on things and thinking, oh, I could have done this better, I could have fixed this. Mm-hmm. So it's at those initial points, you just have to go through that period of... Mm-hmm of dealing with what you put out and trying to continue to improve upon it. It's funny too, because then you look back and you're like, I thought that was so good at the time. And you're like, it wasn't. (laughs) Right. And you try to feel good about it because you put so much time into it. Yeah, yeah. But I think that's just like the creative process, no matter what you do. so. So going back to college and the time that you spent there, were there any professors that you really appreciated? <laughs> that's that's to not to no that's not to say that I didn't like them I don't think that there was anybody that like made specifically like a huge impact I I would say I had more connections to my co- professors in at Madison just because I spent more time with them and we had like a small group of them that would kind of we would take multiple classes from different people um, I think my favorite class I ever took was called cloth to clothing and I liked it because it was basically a combination of like our, what our whole degree was which was textiles and apparel um so when i say textiles and apparel our degree creatively was kind of split like we um learned how to do screen printing fabric dyeing weaving embroidery um like focusing on the textile and then we in textile science and then we also learned like creating a, a, apparel so Um, we had a class where we had to first do something, manipulate the textile in a way to transform it into something new and then create a garment from that textile. So I made this like crazy gown that was silk chiffon, um, that I had like dyed and then I had like stitched all of these like, um, trims onto it to like manipulate like the shape of like the I guess texture of the fabric so um it's it was cool to see like the start of this like plain white chiffon fabric turning into this like really wild creative looking gown yeah and I'm sure that everybody had created such a transformation in in the stuff that they were making and I think in a class like that you have so much control over what you're creating the Mm -hmm. the limitations aren't there that much because usually you know professors try to put out very strict requirements for like what they want but it sounds like Mm -hmm. this professor just wanted you to make something that was different that had Mm -hmm. a few elements in it yeah it was mostly like I don't I don't remember exactly like what the whole trans I'm sure we had some prompts for how transformative like the fabric had to be but yeah it was really cool to have that sort of like open creativity of like you could do anything you wanted to the fabric essentially and like yeah dyeing it sewing things onto it I mean I think if anything like that class reflects sort of the type of work I do now compared to anything else that's cool that's cool that you got a look into the process of creating and playing around with materials Mm -hmm. and just going through that entire creative process so after college what did you end up doing so towards the end of college when I was finally like looking for jobs and everything or all of us were I think that's like when we started to realize like okay like the next step the like next step is to be an assistant designer at a fashion company that's kind of like the entry level position for somebody with our degree. So um, I didn't have anything lined up right away, but I wanted to stay in New York. So I like worked at a restaurant all summer and was just like applying to places. And then I started working in the fall at a 
fashion company um, that was very much like it, not like its own label sort of but like we basically designed for designed for and had our salespeople sell the pieces to other brands so that they could put like their label on it and it becomes theirs so it was fast fashion and it was very like like what I, I call it like the ghost writer of the fashion industry type of company because we're creating all of these trendy looks, but they're mostly getting put under um, other people's labels, which was fine. That wasn't the part of it that I didn't love. Um, it was just sort of my first peek into how a lot of the fashion industry works. And I think um, seeing sort of how much of a like system it is and not really there wasn't really a lot of room for creativity that's what kind of like disappointed me about it um and so I was there for a year because I felt like I had to be because I feel like if I at the time I was like in my head I was like if you don't stay somewhere a year then the next place you try to work is gonna be like, why did you leave that job so soon? So I hated it so much and I wanted out after like the first like month, but I just stuck it out to like maybe see if things would get better or like what it would turn into. But yeah, essentially like I was an assistant designer and my leads would go out to like all these stores like Forever 21 and Free People and whatever. And they would just buy items and they would come back and they would give it to me at my desk and just say like, sketch this. And I would sketch these exact pieces from stores that were out there already. And then we might change like a detail or add a button or like not do it in a pattern or whatever. Maybe change little things to specifically appease like our buyers, what we knew that they might want. But um, we weren't really like really creating anything from scratch. It was all very much just like reproducing what's out there or looking at the trend forecasts and trying to follow their color scheme or um doing like trend research like if I didn't have any like sketching to do I could just sit at my desk and be like yeah I'm doing trend research and just go online and just like be like online shopping essentially and just looking at stuff and saving pictures um so yeah that was my first job it was not ideal um yeah that's so interesting to hear that a lot of these big retailers like the TJ Maxx's and the Targets in mm -hmm. those sort of stores they work with these type of companies yeah. that it seems like there's really no crazy method to it. It's basically just finding whatever's popular and then mm -hmm. recreating it, which is so crazy to think about. Do you think by being at that company, you were very kind of empowered or encouraged to go out and do your own thing because you realize like, oh, if they can do it, like if they are these, if they're working like with these big companies that I can do my own thing and really make it happen. I think that I just realized very quickly that I didn't want to be in that environment. So I didn't know, when I left that job, I didn't really know what I was gonna do or what I was gonna be, but I missed creating and making things, like and being hands-on. So I just didn't wanna be in a corporate fashion environment where I was sitting at a computer and designing things. Like, I just realized that very quickly. So it wasn't really me seeing what they're doing and being like, I can go do this on my own. It was just being like, well, this is not it for me. So I need to get out of this and go be creative and figure out like what kind of path I do want to take. And what was like the next pivotal step in your career journey? Um, well, I did and I was applying to a lot of other design positions because I also felt like, okay, maybe this company sucks and I can find something else that I, I like. But I think like deep down, I just really knew I wasn't going to be happy anywhere else. And so I tried, but I didn't get another job. And so then I, like the restaurant that I worked at that summer before I got the job, Someone reached out to me and said, I'm working at this other place. Do you want, are you looking for work? And then I just was like, cool. Um, and I quit the fashion company and started serving. Cause I was like, at least then I'm making money doing something that doesn't matter to me. And I can focus all of my other time on figuring out what it is I want to do. 
Um, the next like pivotal moment for me from there was that I got this job doing um, at this company called Denim Therapy, which was a denim repair company. Um, they used to have this festival in New York called New York Denim Days. And I just like heard about it and wanted to go. So I went by myself and I had like, I had remixed a pair of jeans, like thrifted a pair and cut it up and put like um, fabric behind it and stuff. And while I was at this Denim Days festival, I was stopped by somebody who worked at Denim Therapy and he was just like, I love your jeans. And I was like, oh, I made them. And um, then he asked me what I did, like where I worked. And I was like, oh, well, I work at a restaurant. <laughs> like, I don't really have anything like fashion going right now. Um, and he was like, well, you should be doing this. Like, you should, you should come and check out our company. So um, I like kind of became an independent con contractor for them. But I was essentially like their creative repairs person. So um, they're like, bread and butter of their business was just like repairing like darning like crotch repairs and stuff essentially but anytime a customer came and they wanted like cool patchwork or like an applique design or like to repair in a way that wasn't just your typical reweaving of the denim um then they would just kind of like let me work with those clients um as a contractor so yeah that was my first like look into like oh, I can actually like have a job doing something very creative and hands-on where like, I'm the person that's creating. Um, and kind of around the same time, I took the money that I was making at the restaurant and I got myself a studio space in, in Bushwick. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it and I didn't tell anybody about it for a while because I didn't want anyone to be like, oh, well, like, what do you, like, you know, like ask too many questions because I just didn't know. Um, and so as I was working at the denim company, I started to go to my studio more regularly and I would just go to thrift stores and buy up a bunch of denim and just like play around with making stuff with it or take thrifted pieces and remix them um, because it, it kind of out of necessity, like that was just like the cheapest, easiest material to buy. So that's kind of where that all kind of started. Were you just wearing all your creations or what were you doing with them? Um, yeah, at the time I was wearing them, I, I had like started around the same time, I think, um, like making choker necklaces out of trims from trim stores. And so I was doing markets selling my necklaces. And so then that kind of led me into connections to start doing markets selling my pieces. So that's probably the first place. Yeah. I started selling them was just like doing little like markets and events. And you were selling most of your stuff through Instagram, through your website. How were you selling to customers? Um, yeah, I think, well, Instagram has been like my primary source still is of like getting inquiries from people even more so than email or my website. Like that's just kind of like where I'm able to connect with people because it's really like a portfolio, you know, like people can go to your page, see all of your work and then message you. So, um, yeah, like that's, that's where I started was just markets and then kind of word of mouth or like posting something and then someone reaching out about it. Um, and then probably about a year, maybe less into doing this, I actually got involved with the canvas. So that is like the first real place that I was selling my things regularly. And how did you get connected with the canvas? Um, so going back to the New York denim days thing, um, I, through that same person that got me the job at Denim Therapy, got connected to actually get to go sell at New York Denim Days, like the following year. So that was kind of a cool full circle moment of going to this random thing because of interest and then the following year being there and like selling my pieces. Um, and then while I was there that weekend, I met someone, um, who you probably know, Noor, from Norism. And um, she loved my jeans and wanted something similar. So I found a pair of thrifted jeans as a thrift store and like remixed them in the same way that I did mine, like a waist alteration. And then the canvas was doing their pop-up in Williamsburg at the time. And 
I was going to meet up with Nora to give her the pants that I created for her. And she was like, oh, my friend's selling at this pop-up. Come meet me there. So I went and met Nora at the Williamsburg location. And then I met Devin there that day. And this was before the permanent location had started. So I was just like, oh, I make stuff too. Like, could I sell with you guys? And then um, I started selling with them like right when the first store opened up. That's really Spark. cool. Or I guess second store because there was a, a breeze side one. But right. Yeah. It sounds almost like these pants were <laughs> the uh, the key to unlock yeah. doors. Do you still have these pants? Um. Yeah, I do. You still have them. But that's yeah. If you look at everything. Is it one of your better designs, or how do you feel about them? Um. I haven't done that kind of design in a while. I could revisit it. I think I have trouble sometimes revisiting designs because I just have new creative ideas and then I move on to the next thing. Um. But. Yeah, it is sort of funny, like, made these pants, like, went to this festival, met this person, got this job, sold at the festival, met Noor, did her pants, brought them to the canvas, started selling, like, it really, like, it and I really so believe in that, like, ever since moving to New York, I feel like, and my friends will make fun of me, because they're like, what is your life sometimes, because it, it's always like that, but I feel like it's because, like, I'm throwing myself into things that feel right. I don't know how to explain that, but I feel like I open myself up to these opportunities or like you kind of like, I go and I do things if I'm like slightly interested in it. And I just, I feel like opportunity lives everywhere and you just have to stay open and just like, um, kind of trust the process. Um, because yeah, it's it's really interesting. I've I've found that one thing always leads to the next thing, and um, it's kind of beautiful to like see that whole progression after it's happened. But while you're in it, you just have to like trust that things will lead to the next thing constantly. It does seem like you weren't going into any of these things with expectations. You were most more so focused on just doing what you were interested in, mm -hmm. and then things started to play out. Yeah, I think just, yeah, like, if you want to do something or you're interested in anything, like, specifically, like, I think just, like, taking that first step of putting yourself in a situation or an event or anything where, like, you're around people that are doing what you want to be doing, like, that's going to lead you to it eventually. And so, at the time that you met Devin, who runs the canvas... Mm -hmm you were creating in your studio space and did you have your chain stitch machine and did you have your company the untrend shop how did that um, all start to come together yeah so i did have the company um i had um established the untrend shop in like right before denim days so that was like my first kind of debut view of everything and then i that's where i met nor so i met devin a few weeks later i think um so yeah, that was really kind of the start of everything. That was the end of 2018. Um, and then at the same time, I think, yeah, at the same time as all of this was happening, I, um, the restaurant that I was working at, because I was still doing that hustling to make money, um, I think, yeah, they closed for, like, randomly. They were like, we're closing for a couple of weeks. And everyone was like, what the heck? So I it forced me to be on the job hunt a little bit because I was like, oh, I, I you know, want to have something stable. I don't know what I should do. And then I got a job working. I got a job as a tailor at Levi's because I was in this position of being forced to look. And then I found the Levi's position. So um, that was kind of my next step into doing more tailoring work. And kind of I knew that at some point I wanted to turn my like whatever I was doing, like restaurant work, like I knew that there was some other type of consistent job I could have that could be creative, that could pay me well so that I wouldn't have to do other side random jobs. Um, and so Levi's was like the first step into that of like being a tailor. And then that's where I started to learn how to do chain stitch embroidery as well. So you were basically working with customers to tailor, tailor the jeans to make them fit better for them? Yeah, we were, well, so I was on a team, um, like, in the store, actually. So we had, like, our, all of our sewing machines and chain stitch machine, like, in the Levi's location in Times Square. And so it was, like, 
taking in orders and um, doing like gene hems and waste alterations and tapers. Um, and then people were really excited about like customizing, still are excited about customizing their, their denim. So we would do basically like anything from putting a name on a jacket to like crazy creative, like huge back pieces. Um, we also, at the time, because it was the new flagship Times Square like store that we had all opened together, um, that we would we had like this partnership with um, Extra TV. So they would bring in and interview um, celebrities every single week in the front of the store, and that was kind of a cool thing too, because sometimes we would get to make jackets for them. So like, I think the coolest one I ever got to do was like make um, chain stitch a jacket for DJ Khaled. Like, when oh, his album wow. was coming out. Um, like, you know, who knows to this day if he still, like, has it or worse. You know, it said, like, Father of Assad or something on the back of it. But, um, yeah, but there was a lot of really cool opportunities with Levi's. And just kind of that was my first position, like, being a tailor and an embroidery artist. And kind of, like, um, realizing that that was, like, another step, like, another type of thing that I could be and I could do. Um, and did, survive here. <laughs> and did Levi's provide the chain stitch machine, obviously? Um, yeah, yeah. We had, like, it was, essentially it was an employee of the store, but just as a tailor. So it was a team of us, and we had machines, like, all in the store. Um, but then from there, that's when I started getting really involved with kind of learning about chain stitch. I started following a ton of people on Instagram that were, like, had their own chain stitch businesses, and that's when I was like realizing, oh, like this is kind of its own business. Like you can really do this full time or like it seems like people are doing it. And so um, after about a year of being at Levi's, I went and purchased my own chain stitch machine. And I know just from kind of hearing about it, it seems like it wasn't that easy to find a chain stitch machine. Yeah, yeah. I consulted a lot of different people on like who to go to. Um, there are companies that make like brand new machines, but they're like kind of clunky and like not my, like not the best. Um, then there's vintage machines, but if the machine is too vintage and it's not like cleaned properly or like had any parts replaced, it could kind of also be like difficult to work with. Um, the seller that I got mine from like completely strips the machines, like replaces a bunch of parts, like, paints the body of the machine if you wanted to. So that's why my machine is pink. Um, so I knew I wanted to go with him based off of like tons of different reviews and everything that I had heard from people. Um, but even still, it felt like a risk because I was like ordering this $3,000 machine from India from this like seller. I mean, he's a verified like eBay seller and like we used PayPal and like it was secure, but it still felt like okay, like, I hope this machine is, like, going to be everything it's supposed to be. Um, and actually, even within the chain stitch like, world, there's some controversy with this seller and with machines because people are passionate about having authentic machines that have all the original parts or that at least are replaced with other parts that are originals. So, like, my machine is a vintage machine, but it has a ton of replaced, like, newer parts, which... In my opinion, I don't care. I'm just like, if it works really well and if it runs and it's smooth, then I'm happy. Um, but yeah, it's, it is a Singer machine. But who knows, you know, what percentage of the machine is new parts. But yeah, it runs beautifully and it all worked out. <laughs> yeah, you have worked with this, she this machine for a while now. Mm -hmm. And at that point when you decided to invest in this sewing machine, did you have a plan for what you were going to do with it? Did you know that you wanted to expand your business to do chain stitch? Yeah, so I think, well, with what I do, it's upcycling, and essentially a lot of what I'm doing is taking thrifted denim pieces and then doing applique or reconstruction and reimagining what those pieces can look like. So in learning the embroidery, it was just kind of this perfect addition to the work that I already do because being able to then stitch any kind of image or anything onto my pieces, like I knew that that was just gonna like add another element of um, 
yeah, texture, creativity, like just kind of like make my creative pieces that I'm selling in the store, like elevate them. And then I also knew that there was uh, this possibility of just getting paid to do commissions, which is huge because that was a way for me to then start expanding the business to offering the custom embroidery for people as well. And how would you explain your design style or when do you know to incorporate lots of artistic elements with the chain stitch? How do you go about making your clothing? I usually am inspired by the original piece. So if it has a really cool shape to it, like the, the garment, if it has a cool like sleeve or if it has like something about it that I think could be emphasized more. Um, I kind of let like the piece speak to me first. And then I have a ton of scrap materials, scrap leathers and stuff. So sometimes I'll repeat a specific design um, if like the jacket feels like it's right for it um, or I'll kind of like be inspired by the fabric and kind of like how I can fuse that with the piece. And then with embroidery, a lot of that has been me having ideas of more so like motifs and stuff that I want to put on the garments and then like drawing them out and then embroidering them. So it's kind of a combination of all of those things, but I would say my aesthetic is, it's very feminine, but also with like a little bit of like darkness sometimes. Um, I would say that I go for a lot of um, either nature or like human body parts. So it's like, I love doing things with like mushrooms and flowers and clouds. And then I also love doing things with like the human heart or like eyes or mouth or hands. Um, and then incorporating words or phrases is also a thing that I love to do. So it's kind of become a mix of all of those things. And I don't know why it just like, that's what naturally comes out of me. I think you have a very defined style. I have noticed that you like to use a lot of those nature and mm -hmm. human elements, yeah. which is really cool and something that's specific to you. So you're doing your designs mostly at the canvas where you have your sewing machine and you're also selling your clothes, you're doing commissions, different things like that. You're also working at Levi's and all this obviously it makes you happy and it's something that you're really interested in. Can you, can you like define or you, can you maybe specify like what moments really make you realize that this is what you enjoy doing? Um. Cause I guess I should say like from my perspective or from my observations, one of the coolest things is like when you make a patch for somebody mm -hmm. and they get to see it and it's like exactly how they pictured it and they are, yeah. they're like super happy to like, have this creation that they thought of and then you made it come to life. So yeah. can you think of any moments? Um, yeah, I mean, I do appreciate and like that. Um, I think that I get like, I get more excited when a customer comes into the store and sees one of my custom pieces, something that like came out of my brain and it connects to them in like their own way. Like they put it on, they feel like it was made for them and that it, it encompasses like their aesthetic. Like I think that's a really cool like connection type of thing because when I make these custom pieces, like I have no idea who's gonna end up with them um, and who's gonna feel something when they see that. So I think probably any artist would say that it, it's really special to see someone you know look at something that you're you just thought of and like was in your brain and and to feel like it was it's made for them so i think that's definitely like when things feel rewarding um and then yeah i think well so after levi's i then worked at another company called bell staff and then another com and then nordstrom so i think another moment that's kind of felt like rewarding and worth it um has been kind of seeing the evolution of being able to kind of work for all these different companies and um, kind of not just not just turning my what I want to do with my business into like my reality, but also 
um, being able to be like an artist working at these companies and for these brands um, is something that I didn't necessarily think that I would be doing. So th that's also been really rewarding. It's just kind of like see how that's evolved. And um, yeah, even now I have some new opportunities coming up where I will be working with companies even more as like an artist coming into their corporate environment to like design and help like create custom embroidered pieces. So yeah, that, that feels really special to be considered more of an artist now that I've like followed this path. That's so cool. There's so many companies that it seems like you've contributed to and even you're building your own company. So what is it that you have planned? You're obviously talking about working as an artist with mm -hmm. these other companies and you also have your own company. Mm -hmm. So what do you see for the future? Well, something I'm really excited about right now is that um, pretty much ever since the beginning of this year, I've been doing like more and more events. So um, basically where I take my embroidery machine to a store um, for a couple hours and do on the spot embroidery for their event. Um, so that's been ramping up and I've been working with more and more companies just doing these like Saturday or Sunday events at their stores. Um, so yeah, that's a, a part of the business that um, I'm just really excited about because it's fun to be able to work with new brands and to also, I, I mean, I love doing the events. Like it's, you never know what kind of customer is gonna come up to you and what they're gonna want and you're doing it on the spot so it's a lot of pressure and it's kind of like crazy but I think like it always feels really rewarding after like a weekend of doing like an event. Um, so that's really exciting. And then yeah, like I said, there's another company that um, like wants to bring me in as an artist to help create like a small collection, like do a small drop. So that's a new part of the business that I didn't necessarily think I would be a path I didn't think I'd be going down, but now I'm more excited about it because I'm like, there's probably other big companies that want to work with small artists. And I think that could be a really interesting way to like continue on with the future of what this is. So yeah. that's really cool that you're looking at these ways to expand your business and you're also being presented with opportunities to mm -hmm. contribute to these companies as an artist is there anything that maybe you're thinking of but you haven't yet committed to what do you want to do with the future of untrend shop do you want to mm -hmm. get a retail location what's what's the goal i think i have this i've always had this dream in my head of a shop that has that's a thrift store that also has tailoring as an option and embroidery and a section of the store that sells specifically custom upcycle pieces. So whether or not I will ever put that vision into reality, I am not sure. I have definitely felt torn about it because, well, I think that like fast forward getting to that point would be, and being in that position of like, that's your store, it would be so cool. Um, the process of getting there is so daunting and I think, I have to think too about what makes me happy and I am not totally convinced that like being super tied to like a specific retail location that I have to be at every day to like make run is something that I would be happy with maybe. Um, so it's definitely something that's probably worth trying. But yeah, I just have this vision of like this really cool thrift store that also has all these like customization things going on with it. So that's, that's the maybe like future long term possible growing the company type of goal but at least for now um I think I'm just excited about getting to put more of my ideas um into creating new pieces because I think the past like couple of months I've been like really 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 busy since I quit at Nordstrom and just kind of like catching up and now I feel like I have some space to create so that's kind of where I'm at currently that's good to hear Based on everything you've been talking about, it seems like you're very happy about the position you're in and yeah. you feel really good about all the things that you've created and that you've been able to be a part of. So what advice would you give to somebody maybe wanting to do something creative or wanting to do something in fashion as a designer? 
I think that the biggest thing, the best thing that you can do as a creator of any kind is just to consistently remind yourself to like trust yourself. Um, because I think that one of the hardest things about navigating a creative industry as an independent person, independent designer, contractor, whatever you are, is learning which opportunities make sense for you and are worth your time and are going to lead to other things and which opportunities or which um, situations might not. And also trying to figure that out is um, you can't avoid, you know, going in and learning from those maybe opportunities that you shouldn't have taken or shouldn't have done. Um, but I think just like trusting yourself in the process is um, the best advice that I can give because I think that over time I've started to navigate um, how to sort of like protect and know like what I'm worth as an independent designer and artist and to sort of like be able to say yes and no to different opportunities. Um, and that's actually, yeah, something that we didn't even really talk about today, but I think um, that's just another part of it is just being an independent artist and um, yeah, lear learning. You have to go down those wrong paths to learn those things, but then I think just um, the next time something comes up and maybe doesn't feel like it's the right opportunity that's going to lead to things, to the kind of like trust that you know better and that you know how to lead yourself to the right opportunities exactly there is so much stuff that people can learn from the journey that you've been on and i really appreciate you coming on here and speaking about all the things <laughs> that you've been involved in last thing i want to ask you is how can people connect with you and you know support your your vision um yeah so my instagram page is the untrend shop um, so you can follow me and connect with me there. I also do post a lot of more behind the scenes process stuff on my personal page, which is just Allie Untrend. Um, and then my website is theuntrendshop.com. I don't have a lot of my custom upcycled pieces on there, but I have like my earrings and a few other pieces that are embroidered. Um, and then, yeah, like I post a lot of the different events and things that I'll be at on my page on Instagram. And then if you want to physically come and see me, I am at the Canvas store at the Oculus working out of the window Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday every week. So I'm, I'm there almost probably more than that too, but pretty consistently every week. So even if people want to come and have a consultation with me to get a custom piece done or a patch made or add embroidery to a existing garment that you have, you can come and see me there. Wonderful. I'll have all of that stuff, all that information put in the episode description so that people can instantly access and support what you're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course.